Hello everyone, here is uh, Tatiana Bazzichelli, the director of the Disruption Network Club. Uh, close uh, to me, there is uh, Mauro Mondello, journalist, writer, and uh, documentary filmmaker. We curated uh, this conference together, so I'm also very happy to say welcome, Mauro. So we will start in a few minutes with uh, our keynote, uh, Corruption Unveiled. It will be a conversation between Yulian Lissenthaler and Frederick Obermeier about issues of power and abuse of power. So here, uh, close to me, there is uh, Julian Hessenthaler. He's a former security consultant. He became known for organizing the video that triggered the so-called Bids Affair. In 2017, he filmed the then, then FPO leader Strache and his party colleague documented the willingness to engage in corruption. The affair led to breakup of the Australian federal government in May 2019. In 2022, Essenthaler was sentenced to three and a half years of imprisonment. The charge he faced had nothing to do with the production of the Biza video, as we will see during the panel. But he was conditionally released in March 2023 after serving two thirds of his sentence. Instead, Freddy Obermeier is actually the second time he comes at the Disruption Network Club. He was also with us at the event Dark's Heaven, if you want to check, back in 2019. Um, he's a, a book author and Pulitzer Prize winning investigative reporter. Together with Bastian Obermeier, he initiated the Panama Papers, the Bahama Leaks, and the Paradise Paper investigation. He is the co-founder of the Anti-Corruption Data Collective, a board member, uh, yeah, and board member of the Arab Reporter for Investigative Journalism, and author of several books. In April 2022, Obermeier took uh, a new role as investigative journalist for Der Spiegel, a co-founded paper trail media that is a company specializing in international investigative research. So now I leave the stage to you. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Tatiana. <clears throat> it's really great to be here, and thanks a lot to Deutsche Bahn. I really came on time. Also, I was supposed to arrive two hours ago. Um, yeah, it's a real pleasure for me to be here, back here, especially to sit here with Julian Hessenthaler. But first of all, I'd like to check a little bit of, about the audience. We are speaking about Austria, so I just wanted to know, is there, are there any Austrians in the audience? Okay. People will raise your hands who have been to Austria already. Have those raising your hands who have seen kangaroos? Okay, great. So that's, a, that's a good check. Um, so we are on the right panel. Um, I want to start with some remark because for me it's, I'm in a strange situation. I'm sitting here with um, a source a source of my colleague uh, Bastian Obermeier and me. Uh, normally I'm not speaking about sources. That's the reason why for several years we did not uh, officially confirm that it was Julian Hessenthaler um, who is behind uh, the Ibiza video and um, that is him who handed us it over to us. Um, we agreed beforehand that this uh, is not valid anymore because it's public knowledge, so I can speak openly here. So this is not normal for a journalist, so that's the few remarks um, before we are going to start. I can still remember because we were meeting f nearly five years ago for the first time, and I can still remember sitting in front of a very nervous uh, Julian Hessenthaler. I didn't know a name at that uh, point in time. That's true, yeah. So actually, I think we got to know each other by name shortly before the release. And yeah, we met. Um, I think we were both nervous even. Yes, They indeed. were nervous. I was nervous for different reasons. But uh, yeah, so we met. I managed to show parts of some video files and try to give an explanation how it came about. And then it got complicated for various reasons. I think we'll... I think before we are getting to the complicated stuff, let's start what is <laughs> in the video. When okay. I, uh, Julian showed the so-called, what is not now known as the Ibiza video to me, that was basically a video of a finca in Ibiza where you could see um, Julian, uh, a woman who was supposed, 
or who claimed to be the niece of a very Russian oligarch and who wanted to spend some dark money. And next to them were Hans Christian Strache. Um, at that uh, point in time, when we watched the video, he was already vice chancellor of Austria. And uh, his close aide, um, Johan Godenus, um, who was at that point in time uh, vice mayor in uh, deputy mayor in Vienna. They talked with this lady and with Julian Hessenthaler about a lot of illegal stuff, about how to illegally um, donate money to the Austrian party FPÖ, how to change the media landscape in Austria to create a media landscape uh, like the one in Hungary. That was the, the goal that Mr. Strache um, addressed. Um, and Strache, who called himself the Red Bull brother from Austria, also spoke about how to take state contracts away from certain con uh, companies and give it um, to um, the, the oligarch's niece and a company that she was supposed um, to um, found. And when I first watched that video, for me, it was like, whoa, that's a bombshell, but there's a huge if, and that's if the material is authentic. It proved to be authentic, and that's how we started to publish it um, in May 2019. It was a Friday. I would be interested how you experienced that evening, because we have met a lot of times before, but not that evening. Not that evening, but I remember I was at your office at noon, I think, on Friday <laughs> before the release. Um, I spent the evening near Munich, near your offices actually, I had some lakeside apartment and I was basically busy with uh, handling the, the media fallout basically more or less, I had to sign all kinds of, uh, uh, how you say, like press uh, for, to release the, the video files to the various press agencies, so I had to sign all that, each one separately, which took uh, quite a lot of time, since different time zones, the story went international, so I was pretty much busy all the night. And the next morning, um, to I think all of our surprises, um, Mr. Strache uh, stepped down, and a few days later the complete government collapsed, and from then on, it was then they started investigations, of course, uh, against me uh, and a colleague of mine. So just to explain, this video idea came about because a friend of mine who was a lawyer, uh, who has a Persian background, so he was obviously probably not quite the biggest fan of the right-wing FPÖ party due to their way of seeing politics or doing politics, and uh, he had a client, as a, as a lawyer, he had a client who was the bodyguard of Strache and who uh, came and told him all kind of stuff which Strache supposedly did and did not do, which amounted to possible criminal charges, just his statement alone was not sufficient to kick off a criminal investigation and that's how the idea of the video came about. And so, um, after the release, after the collapse of the government, like I said before, um, investigations began. They set up a special uh, police unit for that investigation. This police unit was investigating about corruption. So basically, with uh, Mr. Strache and his sidekick as uh, perpetrators, and at the same time against us, the so-called Ibiza group, or however they called it, and yeah, I think that's how it started to come about, um, the aftermath started. That's basically you being in a very strange situation. First of all, you're one of the, I guess, few people who can claim that um, they brought down a government. Um, you're one of the few people who can claim that they ruined a family weekend of mine because I did not expect them to step back. Um, and I mean, just to like really set the stage here, this was really world news. You're like understating here a little bit. This was in the New York Times, in the Washington Post. All over the world there was news reports about the secretly taped video, The Trap, and about what Mr. Strache promised to the alleged oligarch. And 
it was even the Austrian president uh, stepping up, Alexander van Bellen, um, like praising the investigation, praising what uh, became public. Um, so one could imagine all that's good ends good, but it didn't turn out to be like that. Um, Mr. Strache and Mr. Gudinus stepped down. It was very clear that investigations need to be launched. I personally expected investigations only against um, Mr. Gudinus, against Mr. Strache, but pretty soon the investigations turned also against you. Could you explain a little bit what the background was? So the background of the investigation is that basically Austrian law forbids uh, secret taping or secret surveillance. Uh, the point why we did what we did was because the taping happened in Spain. In Spain the law is different. In Spain the law allows secret recordings as long as you're there yourself on the tape. Uh, we knew that given that this uh, colleague of mine was a lawyer, we had checked that before, that's why we we didn't exactly choose Ibiza, but we saw it as a possible uh, place for this, uh, for this happening, for this event. And um, the Austrian police and the Austrian State Prosecutor's Office took the position that since the people involved were Austrians, so the victims, so to speak, were of Austrian uh, citizenship, uh, Austrian laws would apply. That's how they started the investigation against us. Um, that didn't go very far. I was just maybe for explanatory reasons. I was at that time already for a few years uh, registered in Germany at a company in Germany. So it was basically, I had an apartment in Austria too, but I was living in Germany mainly. And all my registrations were in Germany. So the Austrian police tried to get um, support from German law enforcement. They did not. German law enforcement and German uh, justice ministry decided that they had no uh, reasons, no grounds to launch criminal proceedings or criminal investigations. And then something strange happened, going back to the release of the video, on the day that Mr. Strache st stepped down, which was him stepping down after 15 years in politics, very all his time being party leader, so basically a cut in his, in his uh, life and probably a day with a lot of stress. He went on television with tears in his eyes and I don't know what. And on the same day, a police officer from this special unit that was uh, created wrote him a message. And he wrote him a message, um, I hope you can come back, politics misses you. But I think we have to jump in here, like emphasizing what really happened. I mean. It's like a police officer who was supposed to investigate the case. That was the so-called Soko tape. He was the one who had to look into the stuff that happened in Ibiza. And what did he do? He wrote an SMS, a short message, to exactly the one politician he was supposed to investigate, telling him, I think, for the Germans here, I'm quoting directly, Lieber HC, ich hoffe auf einen Rücktritt vom Rücktritt. Oh. Ich hoffe auf einen Rücktritt vom Rücktritt. Die, Ko die Politik braucht dich. I hope for you to step back from stepping back. Politics needs you. So that was the law enforcement official who was supposed to investigate this case. The lead investigator of that police unit, yes. And the same lead investigator of said police unit after they didn't get cooperation from German law enforcement concerning the recordings uh, brought forth charges of blackmail and drug dealings. Uh, these were based at that time on some curious uh, so-called witnesses. There, Somebody came forward claiming that he knew I was involved in some drug dealing. And they claimed that there was reason to believe that Mr. Strache might have been blackmailed. Um, Mr. Strache denied that. Uh, he was asked during the investigations as a witness if he had been blackmailed. He said no. Uh, still, the German, uh, the Austrian criminal police decided that, given his position, it might be plausible for him to be embarrassed of being blackmailed, and that's why the charges were believable, and that's why they would ask for uh, law enforcement cooperation international. They got it, given these accusations. So afterwards, they started investigations in seven to eight European Union member countries. 
Um, Spain, Germany, Latvia, I think, what else? Switzerland, I don't know, quite a few. Uh, Li Lithuania also. Um, and they went quite far with that. So basically they started with the, with the normal investigative measures, I guess. So trying to ta tap phones, um, tracking GPS, cars. Um, that didn't lead to nothing, given that part of my job was at some point so over the time cooperating with law enforcement, so I had a certain knowledge of what they were capable of and what the usual steps would be. And given that I was, it was known to me that uh, this uh, police unit had some strange affiliations, let's call it that, like that, um, I was rather skeptic about their honest investigative approach. And um, so then they went further. Then they started to um, issue EEAs, as they're called in German. I actually don't know what the English translation would be. But it's a European Invest Investigative Order, which is a new instrument within the European Union state member countries, which allows a European Union state country to issue an investigative order and the other receiving country will fulfill that order without checking, without a judge checking if that's lawful or not. So basically, if a judge in Austria says, let's do that, a German police unit will fulfill that request without a German judge or German justice uh, looking into that. So that's what they did. Uh, they found an Austrian investigative judge uh, who signed off on uh, order to to basically go after cell towers in Berlin and Munich. So they didn't have a phone number, they didn't have a phone to tap, they didn't have a phone to track. They had some idea where I might be moving, given my lawyer's offices, given positions as a car I was using, had been registered at. And so they decided to go after the cell towers. Uh, cell tower is basically where your phone logs into, wherever usually it's three of them. Um, so if you're anywhere, anywhere in the city, it doesn't matter actually, anywhere in the country and you have cell connection, mobile phone connection, you will be locked into a cell tower. And uh, if, you gra if you basically go after cell towers as an investigative measure, then what you're doing is you're grabbing every phone that goes over that cell tower. So data from every client registered on that cell tower will be grabbed. And they did that uh, taking approximately 130,000 uh, clients. Uh, about 100,000 in Berlin, uh, in the area of Görlitzer Straße and Hortzmark, and another 30,000 near the train station in Munich. Uh, all that didn't lead to nothing. Uh, all that, again, uh, turned out afterwards to have been illegal, but it already happened. And that's the way the investigations went. So they were basically pushing the borders, if not breaking them. And all that still didn't lead to nothing for them, which led up to some further curious happenings. Maybe you can... First of all, so there may be some of you here in the room who have been also hit by these measures, and this is measures that one would like expect, or I must admit I had expect, um, also like measures being used about severe criminals, maybe even against Mr. Strache and Mr. Gudinus, but not against um, those um, who were responsible for uncovering what happened um, in Ibiza. Um, also, this all happened at a time, which is, I think tells you a little bit about the different standards at a time when the Supreme Court in Austria came to the conclusion that everything that happened in Ibiza was of extreme importance uh, for a debate in the highest public interest. So we saw law enforcement in Austria going to a huge extent to uh, try to find um, Mr. Hessenthaler. And at the same time, there was also investigations against Mr. Strache and Mr. Gudinus. There was a, a parliamentarian inquiry commission put in place. But there were strange things happening um, where it was like full speed against Julian Hessenthaler. It was very slow speed about, uh, against Mr. Strache and Mr. Gudinus. And there was very strange things happening. For example, there was hard uh, drives being shredded, hard drives of the, uh, from the offices of the Austrian Chancellery. 
it was the Justice Ministry who did not want to hand over data to the Parliamentarian Inquiry Commission. It had to be forced by judges to hand those over. It was the Austrian Finance Minister not being willing to hand over information to the Parliamentarian Inquiry Commission. He was also forced um, or needed to be forced by judges to do so. And I think that's important, especially in those days, the Inquiry Commission was led by a man called Mr. Wolfgang Sobotka. Um, he's the uh, president of the Nationalrat uh, in Austria. So in the like hierarchy of the Austrian state, he's the second um, highest position after the Austrian president. And he was member of the ÖVP, that's the party of the then ch chancellor, um, Sebastian Kur uh, Kurz. Um, so they did a lot on paper to investigate um, the case. They then came to, to the conclusion that what um, Mr. Strache offered in Ibiza is according or was according to Austrian law not punishable because he was not yet vice chancellor. He promised something that he would do when becoming vice chancellor, but that was to, according to Austrian law uh, not uh, a crime. It is now, thanks to Julian Hessenthaler, because they changed the law. I think it's, uh, it came into uh, like action, this new law, I think 10 days ago, so quite recently. Uh, so that's some impact. But still, they went after Julian Hessenthaler, not for making the video, at least officially not, but for drugs. And there was also strange things happening um, in that court uh, yard in uh, St. Pölten. Um, I think we, have, we are stepping a little bit uh, fast forward. Julian Hessenthaler was arrested. He was arrested here in Berlin uh, and then extradited to Austria and had to face trial. Yeah, so that's jumping quite a bit forward. So it took about one and a half years until I was arrested on an Interpol warrant here in Berlin, um, extradited to Austria, even though we tried to fight that through the German courts. They were not really willing to look into that too much, um, given that it was pretty politically loaded. And um, so I got extradited, um, facing trial for drug charges. The drug charges were based on Two witnesses claiming that I had sold them drugs. Uh, both of them were um, uh, confidential informants for the, sa the same police unit that was in charge of investigating the recordings for Ibiza. Um, there were no drugs ever found. There, they opened bank accounts, they seized servers, they did pretty much everything you can do. There was no proof found for drugs. Um, so they based the charges on these two witnesses. One of them um, admitted to receiving a pretty high uh, five-figure amount from somewhere from the gambling lobby, which is just to understand. Um, there's a few the few excerpts from the video that. Uh, there were Obermeyer's when the Set and Spiegel released uh, included an excerpt where Mr. Strache says in Ibiza there's a gambling company in Austria called Novomatic and Mr. Strache says Novomatic pays all, meaning all parties. So he's basically starting, okay, this one pays us, this one pays the other ones and Novomatic pays them all. And a lobbyist from this uh, Novomatic group uh, who also claims to be a journalist at the same time um, decided for whatever reason, which is still at least officially not quite clear, to pay um, these witnesses quite a hefty sum of money, also pay their lawyers, also give them jobs afterwards. And these witnesses then came forward to claim that I had sold them drugs sometime, they didn't know exactly, between 2017 and 2018, somewhere in Austria, they couldn't remember exactly where, some amount, they couldn't exactly remember the amount, they were contradicting each other pretty much, um, calling each other not really very, how to put this in lightly, um, not very nice people, claiming that they all lie and whatever, whatever. But in the end it didn't matter. Um, the judge came down with a ruling. The argument of the judge was 
that yes, the witnesses have lied in court, yes, they have received money and it's unclear why, yes, they're contradicting each other, yes, they're calling each other liars and psychopaths and whatever, but that proves that they are telling the truth. Because um, if it was a setup, then both of them would have been telling the exactly same story. And since they're contradicting and lying, it's not believable that they could be not in cahoots. So I got sentenced to three and a half years. I appealed against that just basically because I wanted to go to the Euro European courts for human rights. And to do that, you have to go through the various uh, national uh, uh, appeals. So I did that. I didn't have very much uh, confidence in the Austrian justice system by then. And um, this, this appeal with the European court is still running, so I don't have any result from that. And in the meantime, I think a lot of other things happened, like Frederick already um, started telling you about this uh, parliamentary committee and the aftermath, so maybe you can go into that a little more. I think that was the strange thing. Um, while all those th strange things happened to Julian Hessenthaler, while also like organizations like Amnesty International like put out statements that they think the trial against uh, Julian Hessenthaler was in reality not about the drug charges, but going after um, sources about, against whistleblowers. Um, at the same time, there was one thing leading to another. We had the first inquiry commission, the parliamentarian inquiry commission, and you really have to count now because there's so many in Austria. So the first one, that was the Ibiza thing that was led by Mr. Wolfgang Sobotka. That was the one where the ministers didn't want to hand over um, data. Um, Just to jump in, I think what you missed before, Mr. Sobotka was the head of the parliamentary committee. At the same time, he was under investigation. So he basically led the committee trying to, to put uh, transparency into that matter, but at the same time, while being the head of the committee, he was being accused of being part of the problem. So, but he, didn't, he refused to step down, and the Austrian law does not allow the removal of the head of parliament, so that's how the investigation went. And he didn't see a problem at all, by the way, because why? Why would you? So um, that's Austria, I learned. Um, it is, I think, on this, speaking about organized crime, it's really telling that we start with Austria here. Um, so it's really great for that opportunity. Um, but I think it's, Ibiza didn't stop, and I think that's what's important to know. We had the first parliamentarian inquiry commission, we had a lot of politicians in Austria who did not want to cooperate with the, with the commission. And later, one could understand a little bit why. Because later there was um, certain raids, there was a lot of like, communication that was ha to be handed over to law enforcement. And in the year um, 2001, um, there was already rumors, that's always, in Austria, everything starts about rumors. There was rumors that there is, in this material, that there's chats of Thomas Schmidt, that is a very close aide to the um, then Chancellor of Austria, um, to Sebastian Kurz. And there was already rumors among journalists, I mean, journalists are chatty, they are especially chatty in Austria, there was the rumors that there's something in those chats. Um, and there was something in those chats quite a lot in those chats. So the point was, um, said Mr. Schmidt tried to delete his chats. He just wasn't the smartest guy and he forgot that he had a backup. And so this is the backup, which includes approximately 300,000 chats, which are still not all, I think, even released or even looked at. But part of those chats were already pretty telling. So it was basically the back then, just to understand, 2017 in Austria, there was a right-wing coalition formed between Mr. Kurz and Mr. Strache, um, which is now openly being proclaimed as a pro-Russian government. And that's the story which we brought in Ibiza. We basically told them, okay, we have black money from Russia and we want to hand it to you and you will give us some political favors and you will help us clean it and you will help us invest it. And for that, we're gonna support you by buying a major newspaper and pushing you in the elections. So that was the basic 
backstory to the deal in Ibiza. And so set chats uh, include uh, chats like uh, don't forget which government you serve, you are a whore of the rich, or um, I love my chancellor uh, with kiss emojis and whatever. So it was a kind of political style which nobody was used to seeing and probably nobody even imagined, including myself. And as it is chats, it's chats. Um, they can be interpreted in different ways, and Mr. Kurtz, who is now being charged for making false statements to Parliament, is, his defense is based on that, that he's uh, interpreting his chats in a very different way than most other people are. Uh, it stands to be seen where this will, how it will end. And there is a second investigation ongoing, which is probably the much more much more, the much heavier um, accusation at the moment that um, Mr. Schmidt, who was in control of the, not, he was not a minister, but he was under the minister, but under the last four finance ministers. And so he was basically, the story goes that he was, in reality, he was running the finance ministry. And the minister was just basically a face, uh, to represent the ministry, but really things were happening on his behalf. And um, so the accusation against Mr. Kurtz, the other one is that said Mr. Schmidt used money from the finance ministry to, um, to order uh, polls in a certain boulevard uh, paper in Austria, quite major one. And um, in turn, they got as a kickback, um, they got uh, inserate, what? Advertisement. Advertisement, so state advertising in return. So basically what they did, the finance ministry financed Mr. Kurtz's pause because back then he was not a chancellor, he was still um, trying to become chancellor, so usually the finance ministry should not really be paying for his pause. And in return, the newspaper got advertisements, state advertisements, uh, contracts from the finance ministry again. So basically on both sides, the taxpayers paid for Mr. Kurtz's becoming, or not maybe becoming chancellor, but on his way to getting there. So that's the accusation that's leveled against him now. And from there it goes on to, I, at least I think by now it's like 35 high ranking uh, officials and former officials and supporters, donors of these parties. Basically, as a bycatch of the Ibiza affair, the public learned that the Austrian chancellor, on his way to become chancellor, one of the youngest chancellors, by the way, uh, uh, in Europe, um, falsified or allegedly falsified polls, placed them in very influential um, yellow press um, newspapers, and paid those news newspapers with state ads to run those polls and bringing him to power. So this is something that was then uh, part of the second inquiry commission. Now it was not only against the FPÖ, now it was against ÖVP, that's the party of Sebastian Kurz. So that's, keep on counting please, number two. Sebastian Kurz also stepped back um, as a consequence. Um, he officially claimed that it was because him becoming a father. But um, there is a certain timely coincidence um, with those chats becoming um, public. Um, and now, I mean, just to speak about what Julian mentioned here with those chats in regards to Mr. Schmidt. Mr. Schmidt is, became the head of a very big Austrian state holding. That was basically the state holding that was invested in all major um, companies uh, in Austria. Also, for example, they had stakes or have stakes in ÖMV, the big uh, oil company. So he be became the head of this very powerful uh, state holding. You can imagine how much you earn. And he thanked Mr. Chan uh, Mr. Kurtz for getting that posting. And Kurtz answers, and I'm quoting here in German, kriegst eh alles, was du willst. So you're getting anyway what you want. Um, so, and this is some, one of those messages that Mr. Kurtz is currently claiming in court 
that were, it was simply misunderstood. Um, so you can make up your own mind. He's not uh, yet um, sentenced completely, so um, we will see what happens on that one. Um, during that point in time, you were already in court, I was already in prison. in court and in prison, so I was arrested in December 2020. Mr. Quist stepped back, I think it was the start of the year of 21. Um, my trial went on for seven months, which again is quite unusual for a simple drug case, but whatever. Uh, and um, then I was basically going into appeal, so I was in investigative custody all along, so I was in jail 28 months, all spent in investigative custody, because I was basically either waiting for trial or waiting for appeal. And um, in that time, all, a good part of these things that Frederick mentioned happened. Um, it's still ongoing, so there's basically not no months going by without some new, at least small scandal or a new, new part of some old scandal popping back up. Um, there's also still, um, just to understand how Austrian authorities are still viewing this matter. So, like uh, Frederick said before, there was in Ibiza myself, Mr. Schrache, his kick, uh, his uh, uh, sidekick and uh, said oligarch niece present and the wife of the sidekick. Um, this oligarch niece is also um, being accused of uh, criminal misconduct. Um, the charges leveled against her because the authorities couldn't find out who she was. So the point was they had a video, they didn't have a name and they couldn't identify her. And that obviously drove them pretty crazy. I was not being cooperative. and. Um, it took a long time for them to find some, some picture material of her because the newspapers releasing the video had um, pixeled the video. And so even today, um, there is an, uh, an investigative order, I think, to Interpol out um, to find her. Uh, the reason for that being is that um, there was a charge leveled against the lawyer because Mr. Gudenos, the sidekick of Mr. Strache, claimed that he had been shown a copy of a passport of this niece to prove her identity. And um, that would be uh, fraudulent documents. Uh, the point here is that the Supreme Court in Austria has ruled long before that a black and white copy or even a visible copy of a document is not a document, it does not constitute a document. Um, so the charge as such was always pretty dubious, but in any case nobody claimed that this oligarch needs was present when this supposed document or not document was shown. Um, the charges against her are based on that, so the police in Austria are still to this day saying, okay, her picture supposedly was on the document, and if her picture was on the document, then she's part, possibly part of a fraudulent document, which is somehow still arguable. Um, where it stops to be very rational and very logic or even arguable is that in, I believe, start of this year, the charges against the lawyer were dropped with the argument, the legal argument being made that there was a Supreme Court decision, rightly so. Um, that states that a copy of a document is not considered to be a document, thereby it cannot be a fake document. Um, the charges against her were not dropped for the same, for the same affair, for the same uh, matter, uh, which is hard to explain in my eyes, and I've seen quite a few investigations in my life, but I have yet to find somebody who can explain me how that is possible. But, however, there is still to this day, as far as I know, an uh, investigative order to Interpol out to uh, get a hold of her and to question her based on these charges. So, it seems even to this day that the Austrian authorities are not measuring by the same, by the same how you say, metrics in these cases, but, however. What is your personal takeaway from what happened? You have been 
investigated, you have been indicted, you have been sentenced, you have served prison. The oligarchs, the alleged oligarch's niece is searched by the Austrian authorities. Your friend, the lawyer, also uh, had a lot of troubles, also like with his, the, uh, the lawyer's chamber um, in Austria. Mr. Strache had to step down, but he's walking free. Mr. Strache has been accused in, I think, almost 11 criminal proceedings. Of those criminal proceedings, I think almost all but two have been closed. Um, he has been indicted, but in appeal, he won his appeal. Um, so he's to this day a free man. Everybody is a free man. There is nobody has seen jail from all these people who have been under investigation, been accused, whatever. Some have been sentenced to relatively light uh, minor sentences for, I don't know what, bribery or something in that direction. Um, no, none of the major players have been. Um, Mr. Strache, Mr. Kurz and everybody else continue to travel the world freely. Um, that's how the Austrian um, rule of law works. Um, and what I've learned is that, on one hand, I'm coming out of a corner where I understand how law enforcement agencies work, I understand how investigations work, I understand the, how you say, the, the framework of those and where it's sometimes being pushed and where it's sometimes being bent and whatever. Um, so, but I did myself not expect that it would be possible in such a public case to bend and push this far. Uh, this is something which I've learned that uh, there's a certain level, a certain extent you can go to, um, being the source or the, 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 the one hand giving information or, or the messenger, or however you want to call it. Um, but if you exceed that level, uh, that, that uh, threshold, then you can and probably realistically should, not rightfully, but realistically should expect um, to encounter heavy consequences. That's something that experts and advocacy groups are criticizing already for years, not only in Austria, by the way, but also in Germany, in many other countries like the US as well, that um, in such cases, especially when it comes to whistleblowers, um, in many cases, the whistleblowers are the ones that suffer the consequences of such revelations. Either they are losing their job, they are indicted, they um, suffer personal problems because of the publicity, because of the rumors, um, the bad mouthing. Um, and still there is brave people out there. Um, I mean, if we think about what became public in the past years, um, the Snowden affair, the Panama Papers, Paradise Papers. Quite recently, uh, here Stefan sitting here, OCCRP was part of our investigation called Cyprus Confidential. It was also based on whistleblowers um, data and which re revealed that a very high ranking German journalist was um, paid by a Russian oligarch while making fancy uh, portraits and interviews with Mr. Putin and not seeing a problem um, and no conflict of interest. But what I, asked myself and that did not dare, I must admit, to ask for a long time, would you do it again? Uh, I have been asked that quite a few times by now by various people. Um, honestly, given everything that has come up and has been put on the table, the answer would have to be yes, but, um, but I would do it differently. So the point is I would not involve, because just to understand, this Ibiza thing was I was asked by my friend who was this lawyer if I had any, because he knew the kind of work I was doing. And he basically asked me, do you have any ideas? And I told him, yeah, I have some ideas. But it, since I didn't take it as a, like a, I didn't seem like a client or a usual customer of mine, um, I handled the whole project basically using friends, acquaintances, whatever. And uh, that's what I would do differently, knowing now what I know about how far uh, the authorities uh, are, were willing to go. Um, I would probably not be willing to involve such people uh, anymore. I would probably try to 
to recruit some professional paid help for that and that's probably what I would do differently. But yes, I think it was necessary and to some degree even worth it. There's one thing I, I'm not sure everyone knows. You ended up with journalists handing the video over to journalists, but this was not your first choice. You tried something else beforehand. Journalists handing it over to journalists? No, you, you handed the, the video over to journalists, but beforehand you also tried a very official way. Um, oh, no, that was not me. That was the lawyer. So, um, just to understand, because there's, we were talking about whistleblowing and all these whistleblowing initiatives and rulings and... Um, so the point was, when I got to this story, when the lawyer asked me if I had any ideas, if I could help, it was 2016. Um, his client, his bodyguard, had been collecting evidence, so to say, quote unquote, um, since 2013. In 2015, the lawyer um, made an appointment with the uh, Bureau of Federal Investigations, the Austrian version um, of the FBI, and um, told them about the matter. So he told them, okay, Mr. Strache is supposedly uh, hiding away some uh, a pretty big amount of cash in the parliament, which he supposedly got from uh, Ukrainian oligarchs. He has supposed to have uh, the bodyguard claimed that he was abusing all kinds of substances, that he was cheating his own party by falsifying uh, documents, whatever, and he went to the federal police and told them about that. He had an appointment. He sat down with two police officers. Uh, these two police officers are nowadays the head of the Federal Investigative Service in Austria and the head of the unit which investigated me. Um, both of them, he told about the matter in 2015, both decided that they did not have enough information to act upon that, however that works, I don't know. And um, both uh, forgot to mention all that after the video was released, they somehow forgot to mention that they already had heard this story in 2015. It was the lawyer of Strache who actually brought uh, some document into the court filings proving that these two officers leading the investigation were actually the same ones who had been informed about the matter in 2015. Whatever they forgot that that happened, I don't know, but this is Austria. So much for law enforcement and investigations uh, in Austria. Before we jump to the Q&A, I told you you have to count the inquiry commissions and I did not do so in vain. We are at two. And I told you not to forget Mr. Sobotka, um, the guy who led the first inquiry commission. And that's import getting important, especially in those days, because in this week there was another secretly, uh, this time not video, but audio released, not by Julian Hessenthaler, um, that's already confirmed. Um, it was, um, uh, as far as one knows, an Austrian businessman who was in a very posh Vienna uh, restaurant sitting down with a man called Christian Pilnacek. He worked uh, for the Austrian Justice Ministry, was a very high-ranking official there. In Austria, they call it Section Chef. Um, and in this meeting, which took place beginning of this year, he claimed in front of his friends and trustees um, that Wolfgang Sobotka, you remember the name, tried to force him several times to kill investigations, to stop investigations against his own party, the ÖVP. Um, this became public this week, um, and you can imagine what the opposition demands. They demand an inquiry commission. That's number three. But there's already two other lining up uh, in Austria, so we would have three inquiry commissions beginning of next year. And you can imagine who is heading all of them. You're right, that's Mr. Sobotka. So, welcome to Austria. So thanks a lot, Julian. I think now the more interesting questions are popping up here. How could they identify you? Because you would have talked with another source. No, 
So they didn't, they couldn't find the phone number I was using, given that I was using some special devices. So what they basically grab every phone, uh, sends the phone sets, sends a code, the, and the SIM card sends a code, it's the IMC and EMI codes. And the cell tower records these IMC and EMI numbers, so that means that the device you're using is identifiable. That doesn't mean that they would be listening into all the calls going over the cell tower, but they would identify the device, and over the device it's pretty easy to identify you unless you go through various measures, but usually do, you do not. So what they did have, they had a rental car, which I had used, and they were basically going after, because the rental cars nowadays have SIM cards installed, so they're going after the SIM card. Where did the SIM card log into? Which cell towers regularly? These cell towers, they tried to grab, and then they tried to cross-reference the phones which were logged in Munich, Berlin, and tried to somehow identify one number which showed up on all these cell towers. Not that I knew that was happening, but I was understanding that there was a certain chance that this would, might have been tried, so I was changing the car. Basically what they did, they identified the location, the time and location of 130,000 devices within the vicinity of these cell towers based upon an illegal investigative order from Austria. And when I changed the car, it kind of proved pointless. There's one over there. Well, first of all, thank you so much for what you've done overall, and I wish you the best for uh, you. the near future. Um, my question is towards the publishing process, um, because you're sitting today next to a journalist who takes source protection seriously, um, but I have also heard that you consider going through a TV personality which apparently doesn't take source protection so seriously. Um, yeah, you're referring to Mr. Böhmermann. Um, the story behind that is quite easily... Um, the point was we were, we meaning me and the lawyer, but basically I, I was the one having the talks, but it was in agreement with the lawyer. Um, so we were in talks with the uh, Süddeutsche, with Bastian and Frederick, and uh, with Spiegel. And pretty late in the process there came, uh, a chance came up to because the point was, I understood that, first of all, for the story as such, but also to some degree for my own protection, the most possible publicity would give me some sort of protection and it would help the story, uh, it would push the story. So I got the chance to get into contact with somebody who I thought would be a good third party, given that a lot of people probably especially the younger generation uh, probably do not regularly read the Süddeutsche and the Spiegel nowadays. And uh, so I thought it might be smart to kind of to go into this, this social media or pop culture to uh, take a TV personality on board who was known or making himself known to have a certain degree of interest in Austria and anti-right-wing politics and whatever. Um, that turned out to be a grave mistake. Um, what happened was that we had a sit-down, we had a meeting, uh, confidentiality was agreed, um, but uh, it was not upheld. Um, six days later, to my own surprise, I saw Mr. Berman on television referencing the substance of the talk we had and that turned out to be, have some pretty negative effects on the store, maybe not on the story, but on, for us, for me, and for the rest of the people involved. Um, but I think that's already been told. It's not something that I'm trying to, to push after because there is, I think every, everything has been publicly said what needs to be said. Here in the first row. Hi, thank you very much. Um, we started the program of this year speaking about uh, prison systems and uh, I would like to ask uh, Julian, how was uh, the situation for you in prison? Um, because you stayed there pretty long and also quite unusual that you end up in a very small prison. So if you could like to tell us a bit more about that and well, how did you experience? Prison is prison, I cannot <laughs> advise it, but um, I was arrested in Berlin. I was uh, imprisoned here in Moabit for close to four months. Um, 
given that I was then uh, brought in front of the Wirecard committee in Germany, the parliamentary committees, that's why my extradition got prolonged a little bit. Uh, Moabit is known as a pretty uncomfortable place. Quite honestly, I found it to be the nicest place I was at. Um, I was afterwards transferred to Vienna. Um, Vienna jail proved to be, I was kept in solitary confinement for uh, close to four months um, on security, uh, fears to my security, so they claimed. Um, that's not nice, Sol solitary confinement is um, not something I can recommend, it's not too healthy um, for the mind and the body. Uh, and then afterwards, the prosecutor's office in Vienna for various, okay, I cannot say reasons, but for probable, how you say, <laughs> issues which uh, probably would help their, their court case decided that they would like to charge the, or to hold the trial to bring the charges not in Vienna, which would have been the logic step since it was prosecutor's office of Vienna running the investigations officially, but they decided to go to St. Pölken, which is a local uh, capital of, uh, of uh, how you say, like, uh, state, yeah, sorry, <laughs> of a state. Uh, so Austria's nine states, um, one of them is uh, the capital is St. Pölken, that's Niederösterreich, which, again, is known as a state for having been ruled by the ÖVP, the party of Mr. Kurz, for the past 40 years. Uh, if that had something to do with them taking the trial there or not, I don't know, but it turned out not to be very helpful for me, and it turned out to be quite helpful for the state prosecutor, given that there's only two judges there handling criminal cases and they both have a certain renome. Um, but, however, whatever, that was the third jail I was in. Um, there I was not kept in solitary confinement. I was placed immediately in general population. Um, it's a, a countryside jail with all the meanings associated with that. Um, the food is good, everything else is not so good. Stand the back. Yeah, um, first of all, thank you to exposing yourself to that risk and sharing that story with us uh, in general and here today. Um, I have a question targeting on the future of those, uh, this kind of projects and whistleblowing. Um, all this uh, relied on the reliability of the media, the video. Now we see very fast progress in so-called AI technologies, making it quite easy to fake something like that. Is this putting like an uh, like very strong defense on all the corrupt people out there, as they can always claim this was generated? Honestly, I'm quite surprised that it has not been brought yet, because especially what Frederick mentioned, this tape recording which was released this week in Austria, and what maybe he forgot to mention, the person talking on the tape recording, died of a somewhat curious suicide a few weeks ago. So he's dead now that his voice is heard on a tape recording. Um, but whatever, however, we will see. Um, but yeah, I was surprised that nobody brought this kind of defense, uh, because especially in cases like this, because now they're, again, basically going this after the same playbook they went with, with Ibiza, saying, okay, not the stuff being said on the tape is the problem, but the tape existing is the problem. So they're basically trying to frame it as a, again, criminal act that somebody was recorded illegally and oh my God, and, um, but the substance of the tape is being, is being pushed aside. Um, deepfakes will be an issue, are an issue. Um, I'm not a technical expert to say or what can be done exactly about it. I know there's some ideas, uh, but I'm really not yet the tech expert to, to talk on the technical uh, fine tunings. Another question here. And one must say the audio tape in Austria, one could see that our colleagues who published it, among others ORF, the public broadcaster, had some worries. They, as far as I know, had three voice analysis by forensic experts done before um, 
publishing uh, that audio tape. So they had exactly uh, those fears um, in regards to the tape. And by the way, also it's not good for my profession, but one must say that the uh, person who handed over the secret tape, uh, his cover is also blown. Um, it's blown by, unfortunately, a journalist um, revealing it. Um, so there's now also uh, a discussion about uh, source protection in Austrian media. But uh, here is the question in the fourth row. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, this sounds to me a bit like state capture, and <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty shocked because we are in, in the European Union. And I just wanted to ask you, like, has any European institution done anything about this case? Not to my knowledge. We, during the investigation, we tried to approach all kinds of sites, um, including uh, member states, because in our opinion, the Austrian authorities just basically abused the international law enforcement cooperation by possibly, by possibly um, introducing false claims into the investigative orders. Um, they, I have not heard of any, I know that uh, Mr. von Notz the, from the Bundestag gave some statements afterwards in regard to the investigation. But I think it does, did not really receive too much attention. And I've talked now that I've been released to various people, also people in various positions. And um, basically what I've heard is that, yes, that might all be problematic, but in the end of the day, it's wanted. So I talked to a former justice senator in, from Germany he basically told me, yeah, it might be that this European Union investigative order, the EEA, is being abused, but it was made for exactly that purpose. It was made so when we have an issue, we don't need to go and worry about Hungarian law or whatever. We can uh, run our criminal investigations and that's the price to pay. Um, so, yeah. The similar abuse is taking place with Interpol uh, Red Notice, by the way, that autocratic states are using Interpol uh, Red no Notices against, for example, opposition figures. Uh, I would even go so far to claim that even this, uh, this investigation order against this so-called oligarch needs to Interpol is at least very close to an abuse. So. I had just a very fast question. There was any money trail in this case? No, that was claimed. The point was, there is a backstory to this. The point was that, according to my knowledge, and I believe that knowledge to be truthful and right, um, the so-called uh, client of the lawyer, the source of the original material, was asking for some security guarantees. Um, that's why uh, the lawyer uh, contacted various sites, um, telling that he had a video and he needed money depending on who you want to believe, he either said it like this or he said uh, their claim was that he was trying to sell the video. I don't honestly believe that myself, but however, whatever money was asked, that's where this story came from, that uh, money was paid for the video. But I think all involved have on various occasions stated, I think even under oath, that no money changed hands for the video being published or for the video being handed over or whatever. I think I may add there is one money trail because um, Mr. Strache mentioned in the Finca that if you want to donate money to his party without um, it being publicly declared and known, he described a way. And the way would be giving the money to clubs, to Vereine that are very close to the FPÖ and they will find a way to uh, funnel it to the FPÖ and in the Inquiry Commission they found indeed uh, at least four of those clubs that received a lot of money uh, from Austrian uh, businessmen and businesswomen. I think if we have the time I'll just go back to another curious story because the original 2013 accusations leveled against Mr. Strache by his bodyguard were primarily based on the fact that he had taken pictures of the trunk of Mr. Strache's car uh, with bags full of money. And uh, the story supposedly goes like this, that um, around 2013-14, some oligarchs from Eastern Ukraine approached um, a certain businessman 
close to the FPÖ, and then paid supposedly up to 10 million euros for this businessman to get a seat in parliament. And the money in the trunk, the pictures from the money in the trunk was supposedly from these 10 million euros being paid for this businessman getting a seat in parliament in being supported by these Ukrainian oligarchs. Which is in, in itself a pretty curious story. If you tell somebody that you can buy a seat in parliament in a European member state, you would probably not believe it. Um, in Austria it was not a crime. In Austria it was, there is a loophole, there was a loophole. It's been closed now, again a few days ago. Um, but it was actually legal to buy a parliamentary seat in Austria until about two months ago. So, and Ibiza is now like almost five years ago. So Austria moves slow. So this loophole was closed also thanks to uh, the Ibiza video. Um, but here's another question. You just mentioned the club and uh, that oligarch can funnel money to populist parties. We had the same case with the AfD, where a lot of money funneled to advertisement campaign in 2015, and we still don't know who is the secret source of that. Is your program or your project helped to enlighten this process in other European parties as well? I don't know. Honestly, it was the... This was my, my approach to the story was exactly this. So I was coming from watching the, the 2016 election in the States with Trump and all his these allegations leveled against him with the steel dossier, etc. And that's how I built my story for this Ibiza project. So basically I tried to copy the, the accusations being leveled against Trump um, that money buys political favors, buys influence, buys whatever. And the FPÖ is the only party, to my knowledge, who had an official contract with the Russian uh, the party of Putin. So they went into, uh, into an official uh, contractual agreement of friendship, as they called it, with the party United Russia, I think. Um, which caused quite some disturbance in the, in the national security sector. Um, all that was known. I think what really changed the dynamics was the February 2022. I think that really brought to attention that for everybody, even those who didn't want to see or who were trying to look away, that there is an issue with Russian influence. And that's not saying that Russia is the only issue, but the Russians have been quite, uh, quite adept at, at pushing this kind of operations. I was wondering if it would have been the same if it weren't Russia or Russians. You mean the story or...? Yeah, because I feel like maybe there's this um, internalized like enemy kind of... I don't think it's about enemy. I mean, from my side of view, I honestly grew up with Russians. I, I, I've I'm pretty pretty knowledgeable in Russian culture and whatever, but um, that's not the point. The point, quite simply, is that, and there's reasons for that, don't get me wrong. I mean, there is all kind of, if you ask my personal opinion, that's just really being personal. Um, there have been all kind of mistakes made with how uh, uh, Russia was handled, especially um, after the breakdown of the Soviet Union, especially in the first maybe 10 years of the 2000s. Um, I think Libya was, was the one moment where things turned. Um, the, the UN resolution which Russia didn't veto and afterwards uh, found itself if being more or less uh, stepped over in their view at least and to some degree maybe even correctly so. Um, but, however, whatever, um, what I can say coming from my, my, my view of things or my knowledge of things from the work, what I've done is that, in my opinion, there has been an ongoing professional and well-managed influence operations by Russia since the le last 15 years, I would easily claim. Um, on European politics, on European politicians, and I'm not even would not even want to say that the Russians have a, a certain um, appreciation for right-wing politics because of the politics. I just think it's the 
they found it to work. And that's, I think, what they're, they're basically interested in, in efficiency. And right-wing parties have proven to be rather open to such influence, in my opinion. Thank you, Julian, for um, making all this public and also for taking the time to discuss it in such detail with us today. I wanted to look a little bit into the um, future. Um, is there something with all this discussion about more visible blower protection that you would request from policymakers in order to avoid um, that happening? So what happened to you to happen to other um, whistleblowers? Um, any ideas? Well, I think there is this uh, whistleblower framework by the European Union, which is yet to be implemented by all countries. And the Austrian implementation, as far as I know, is again lacking in a lot of aspects. Um, I think there's various people better suited to answer on that, but I do believe that whistleblowers, and I think even Frederick is probably better suited to answer on that, uh, that whistleblowers nowadays are an essential part of uh, bringing especially big stories public. And I always tell people when they ask me questions like that or similar questions, um, think of how much relevant stories have come up in the past five to 10 years uh, through whistleblowers. And now think of how many of those whistleblowers that you know by name have, um, have gone unpunished or have gone unscathed. And now think how many people are sitting around in this moment thinking about exactly the same issue I, had, I was thinking about. Go public, don't go public, what are the consequences? And if they see what happens, I mean, that's basically, that's what the European court so famously shortly ago called the chilling effect uh, with people being basically frightened by their predecessors going forward and being um, punished harshly to kind of keep others from following in their footsteps. So I think, uh, give them all that, that protection for whistleblowers and whatever organizations uh, or foundations or whatever are there to support these people are valuable and are worth it. Yes, there's the little advertisement block. There is organizations out there who are helping whistleblowers. Uh, one is called the Signals Network. There is the Whistleblower Network. So, and they are always happy if you donate uh, a little bit if you can afford. So, keep them in mind. And there's another question with the gentleman with the glasses. Thank you again uh, for your great overview. Um, before going to my question, a friendly reminder about the good point he made about cell phones. If you go to public demonstrations or participate in civil disobedience, disobedience actions, it is always advisable to turn off the, your phone or at least put it in the airplane mode, if it helps. Now, back to my question. Um, I see that uh, like there is a kind of a ripple effect on politics in Austria, at least the FOP, on, um, and uh, mm, I'm wondering how the party is going to face that. Are, I, mean, I mean, what are they going to do to wash the, back the image? Are these politicians burned out, uh, will be replaced, or what's the plan? Austrian politics has always had some theatrical aspects, um, some comedy aspects even probably. Um, I don't actually know what the FOP is doing, no, I think I'm not quite sure if they even know themselves. The moment they're basically going through with the with the head through the wall uh, tactic, just go 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 on go on go on. Um, if that turns out to be helpful, I doubt. But that's honestly also not my problem. The bigger problem in Austria is that if people are not voting anymore for the FOP, then they're usually voting for the FPÖ, which. It's kind of strange because nowadays, four or five years after Ibiza, the FPÖ, which the party leader at least proved to be pretty corruption, how to put it, um, open to possible corruption, um, nowadays is seen as a, as a party of, uh, of transparency and I don't know what, and the ÖVP is being seen as a corruption-affiliated party. Uh, 
given that both parties were were in a coalition and that stories which we were talking about happened in the time frame of this coalition, it would be rather logical and rational to assume that probably both parties have a problem maybe with corruption issues, but uh, the public doesn't see it that way. Austria is a strange place and has a lot of issues that they try to neglect, so I don't know. More questions in regards to Austria and things that are special in Austria, but as someone coming from Bavaria, I must say not only in Austria. Um, here, um, let's assume that this story will turn into a movie someday, and I can't imagine that it wouldn't somehow. But but are there any parts of the story you will never be allowed to tell somehow? Out, nobody's forbidden me to tell because who could? Um, there is. I decided for myself that people who were in one or other way somehow uh, involved on the on the sideline of things, uh, there is no need to to put them out there because I've learned what happened to me and uh, the oligarch sneeze, in my opinion, has been somebody who has been massively uh, or tried to be massively pressured pressured. Um, on a basis of pretty much nothing. Um, and since it's still ongoing to this day, I must assume that it would be also for other people involved in one way or another, which are not known publicly now or yet. So no, nobody has forbidden me or it's not something, there is not like something that I cannot talk about. Uh, there's details which I will spare on behalf of other people, but that's more or less it. Yes, there is a film, Nicholas Ofcharik, playing Julian Hessenthaler. Um, that's a series uh, that you could watch, I think, even on ORF uh, soon. Uh, again, thank you very much. Uh, I'm from the Netherlands, so very familiar with corruption as well. Um, it's, it sounds like the same playbook. And what you see a lot in the Netherlands is like during the, uh, the reign, let's say, of the political people, they they put all kinds of laws into place or corporations get, and like a lot of damage is done and then at some point uh, a story comes out the relevant people disappear from politics and with it they also kind of disappear from the people's mind and we cannot reverse these things so uh, do you have any yes. comment or, or thoughts on this but the point is and that's where where I put Austria as being so special is in all countries you will find corruption and it's completely impossible to eradicate corruption on all levels. That's, there's like best practice examples in, especially in I think in Northern Europe, but still, I mean, corruption exists. You don't need to even consider um, going, going without it. But like you said, stories appear, stories become public, the people resign, they disappear from the public view. That's where Austria differs. But stories become public, the people still stay. Um, <laughs> nobody resigns. <laughs> and that's, I think, the main, the main difference. Um, but yes, and I mean, just going back to what you said, um, the point was, even in Ibiza, there was a certain moment during these seven hours that we sat together, and also uh, just uh, reconsideration, um, people nowadays think Ibiza was a meeting of seven hours, people got drunk and talked some shit. Uh, Ibiza was negotiations going on over seven months before that, and Ibiza was just the conclusion of these seven months of negotiations. So it was not like somebody just got drunk and then talked a lot of shit and oh my god. Um, but aside from that, so on the evening in Ibiza there is a, a, a segment of the video where this oligarch sneeze is laying the facts down for Mr. Strache. So he's trying to skirt around and like pretend like he understands what we're talking about, but then he doesn't really want to say it directly. And so she tells him in his face, look, what we're talking about is I buy somebody, this somebody changes the law, and I profit. That's what we're negotiating here, nothing else. And she told him that to his face, and that still didn't make him stand up and leave, that still didn't disturb him so much, even though he claimed after otherwise, but just, yeah, that's... That's just, I think Ibiza was, was an exception in the only, not that the things discussed were exceptional, but the way of how they were discussed. First, there, it was on video, 
which is rather rare. And um, the second way thing was that it was just so more or less in your face. It was not like there is, how to put it, like elegant levels of corruption. I remember somebody once told me about some Italian corruption where you see a painting behind the guy and then one moment he turns around and says, you like my painting? You want to buy it? Um, that's maybe a little finesse in the corruption. In Austria it works different. In Austria it's like, okay, what do you want? Okay, give some money to there and then we'll talk about it. In this regard, it may be interesting that even after Ibiza, you stayed in contact with uh, Mr. Gudenos, and as a proof of him and his party still being willing to deal with you, they put out a press statement with a certain code that is quite stunning for me, if you would yeah, elaborate. Yeah, maybe you can translate, because <laughs> Trans go ahead and translate the code. Um, it was a press release that Julian mostly uh, he arranged that there need to be specific words in there. And then if you don't do no news agency uh, press reports, there's normally a code down there. Normally it's like uh, RED for Redaktion and Slash and stuff like that. And all the people who like worked on that um, specific statement. And in this one, if you read it in full, you could read, wer bezahlt schafft an. So who is paying is saying what you have to do. So that's much how openly um, they were discussing things. So I get the message that we have to round up, but there's already the mic is with a lady, so I think we have to uh, give her the chance. Uh, hi. We should give her the chance. Um, Thank you very much for all of this. Uh, I'm Angela Fiore from Il Mitte. As an Italian, I must uh, disagree. We do not do corruption elegantly, absolutely. Uh, and it's always uh, interesting to be reminded how similar our countries are. We should have stayed together and become a corrup corruption-fueled superpower. But anyway, I was interested in knowing just one detail, if you can discuss it. You've mentioned several people who are involved in uh, making this, uh, in the taping, and in bringing this to the public. Uh, and I wanted to ask if you can answer, were you the only person they came after? Because, I mean, we, we can agree no. that it was a, a coming after thing. Mm, so. I would agree, I don't know if we can agree, but I would agree. Um, no, I was not, like I said before, this oligarch needs, they just couldn't identify her. Um, given that we took all kind of uh, steps to, to keep her identity a secret, which worked pretty well. Um, they came after the lawyer too, just the point was uh, on different charges. Uh, the problem was that I, going back to a very old uh, story, which I, a project which I was involved in, which included Austrian law enforcement, which found me on the, I would, put it like that, on the receiving end of a not kept promise, um, I had a prior sentencing. And that's why it was easy to come after me. First of all, they knew who I was, they knew me in some respects, at least not the people directly involved, but the colleagues of this police unit were known to me, so we had some degree of, of knowledge about each other. And it was a pretty logic step. That's how investigations work, you look for the weakest link. And to them, I was the weakest link. You put the, the maximum of pressure on the weakest link and you break the chain and from there the stuff falls down and you start to collect. That's how, it's not very fancy, but that's usually what's, what's that's the brute approach, if you like it. Knowing the brute approach, uh, I think we can be very thankful for you sitting here sharing your thoughts, uh, sharing your insights with us. So I welcome you to give a warm applause to Julian Hessenthaler. Thank you.